I'm tracking several tropical waves for the Caribbean and the Southeast United States, but will they develop? The AI models, the new ones, they're super aggressive. Our regular physics-based models are not. So who wins? What's going on guys? I'm certified meteorologist Jonathan Kegas. In this video, we're gonna talk about that, break down the differences between the two solutions here. And then at the end of the video, I'm also gonna to touch on the big time severe weather threat derecho potential across the upper Midwest and Northern Plains. So stick around to the end for that. I'll have the time codes in the description. So here are our waves, and these are the ones that are getting the buzz that are rolling off of Africa right now. We'll bust out the handy dandy Telestrator, and it's these two waves that could kind of merge through the main development region and become one wave that, again, the AI models are super aggressive on. The deterministic ones, the Euro, the GFS, all those ones that you're used to seeing through the years are not. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to show you the different AI models, and then I'm going to show you some of the physics-based deterministic. So here is what was getting a lot of buzz over the weekend, and it's the Euro AI model. It blew up a hurricane moving into South Florida and eventually turning to the North Gulf. It still has this entity flaring up near the Bahamas or Turks and Caicos. This is August 5th, by the way, and then kind of working its way up the shoreline and heading towards uh, the mid-Atlantic coastline. That is the Euro AI. It is very aggressive and really one of the only models doing that. Now, the new Google Lab AI model from Google, um, it also tries to develop something. Again, this is the one that has the 50 members. Each one of those blue dots is a different member, and the more blue dots you see, the higher chance that the Google machine anyway, the Weather Lab machine, is predicting some kind of tropical development. So this is gonna be August 5th, that same timeline, and you clearly see as we go back in time, all those blue dots start to pop up and head in every which direction, some over South Florida, some out the sea, and then some over the Carolinas. Direction or location of potential impact, that'd be way too early to tell. What we're focused on at this stage in the game is, are we gonna get anything to develop? So I wanna be clear again, I'm showing you those two models or those two AI models or ensembles because I just wanna show you that they are aggressive, but the ones, the models that we've used since the dawn of modeling, the Euro, the GFS, all the other ones that we have in our toolbox and arsenal are not as aggressive. So I wanna show you the European ensembles. And this is what I've been showing you. This is one of the main things to look at, the European and GFS ensembles. Uh, they're again, different conditions put into the ensemble. And the more members that are online are the more confident you have in something happening. So sim similar to the your, uh, to the AI model, how we had a bunch of those blue dots, we do have a few L's showing up. And by and large, this is the one that we are watching for the Northeast Caribbean and maybe Southwest Atlantic. So there's a few L's there. There's one, two, three, four, five. There's five L's out of the 51 European ensemble members. So that's not a high percentage there going forward. All of those are also super weak, 1,000 seven to 1,000, and 1,005 is the strongest. The lower the pressure, the lower that number, the stronger the storm. Let's go out in time here, and there's a lot of L's popping up. There's like a couple different things that it wants to pop something off a cold front, it moves that way. There's also a little something, something out there that I will show you that actually has my eye uh, more so than this way of rolling off of Africa that could be like a short fuse name storm. But anyway, this is the one. Let me change my telestration color. So more models are, more ensemble members are coming online the, the closer it gets to the Turks and Caicos and to the Bahamas, very similar to the AI model, all of which being weak at this time. So big test case scenario or, or big, this is the first really big test because the AI models are new, busting onto the scene. We had the Euro AI last year. This is the first year that's really become operational. Then we had the Deep Lab, uh, the Google AI model come on this year as kind of an experimental thing. Those are both aggressive, but the regular physics-based models are not. It's important to know how they work. The AI is using the past to predict the future. So, okay, hey, it sees a wave in the main development region in early August, and it's a, it's, so it's going back into the archive and looking for other tropical waves in the main development region in August. 
with similar steering patterns and atmospheric conditions. And then it's like, hey, these times it's developed. I think this one is going to develop. Whereas the physics-based models, they're using a complex series of math and physics equations to break down atmospheric conditions as we see from the current standpoint and then take them out into the future. The one thing that's going to be interesting is, yes, it's August. We should be getting ready to see these long-range storms come across from the Cabo Verde archipelago out there, uh, the con African continent. The thing of it is, is maybe the AI models, since they're using a lot of the past to predict the future, they're not really seeing well what is going on in real time. So I have the Saharan dust layer pulled up to show you. Here are those two tropical waves. Let me change my color back to pink so that it shows up a little more. There is wave number one. There is wave number two. Again, we could have a little consolidation as we move out. And then development possible somewhere out here to maybe rolling up in that direction. The darker the reds and pinks here on this map, the thicker, the more dense the Saharan air layer is. The, that dry, dusty, stable air. They are juicy. So that's one thing they have going for them. The waves, they are... they do have a better shot than waves before them to kind of fend off and push up the dust. So that's something we're going to watch. All in all, though, as a whole, overall, the Atlantic is not very stable. So while we have the battle going on between the aggressive AI models and the less aggressive deterministic models, we also have a battle going on between this little bubble of favorability in that's kind of surrounding the wave to an overall not favorable pattern for development. Now, you may notice something here in this bubble of red and orange, and we'll see if you can pick it out. If you know where I'm talking about, post in the comments, because I'm about to answer that. It's this guy right here. That looks fairly healthy on satellite. It's in between kind of two regions of dust. That looks pretty good just at surface level here um and for that i want to go out to a closer satellite loop of this thing and there it is so i wanted to keep it zoomed out for first reference there's florida turks and caicos and bahamas greater antilles into the leeward islands let me zoom in on this Okay, it wants us to draw the box. We're going to draw the box. I'm surprised that this isn't like just tagged for a small percentage of area of interest. I don't have a surface satellite scan from the ASCAT, as we call it, to see if there's a tight center there. But looking at this, and let me loop this bad boy again, if it's going to loop for me. The one thing that I notice right off the bat here. And there is certainly a circulation. Like, if you look close, watch at the end here. I can't tell without an ASCAP pass if it's the mid-level circulation. But look at this. You see all those very thin white kind of appendages? That is a sign. That feathery looking stuff. That's high-level cirrus clouds. And it's a sign that there is evacuation of air in the upper levels of the atmosphere, meaning that the storm is breathing well. So it has that part going for it, that it's in a region anywhere that has decent upper level dynamics to help the storm breathe. That is the outflow, as we call it. So it has that. So I'm just surprised that there is not even like a little yellow bubble to give this uh, a 10% shot. As I showed you back here, I'm going to kind of wind this down a little bit this is where we stand in real time and the european ensembles do have a few members online that lift it up towards the bahamas one of them gets to be a little strong you see the yellow there i mean tropical storm strength in between the united states and the bahamas so i don't think it's going to impact anything but still like, I feel like that's one of the more healthy things I've seen so far to the season out of the three named storms that we've had. Now, again, I can't see under the hood in this satellite channel. I can only see the outflow. That could be a lot of that mid-level center dominant needs to be the low-level center and then maintain thunderstorm activity around its center. It looks like 
the low level center might be here or quasi low level center a developing thing and then the mid level center might be here so that's probably evidence of some tilting going on with the storm so it may not be there but it certainly looks healthy as i kind of just talk out loud with you guys here on this satellite thing doing some real-time uh analysis on this storm with you it's something to watch i would not be surprised though if the hurricane center tags this thing as an invest or at the very least just the yellow one of those yellow bubbles for a low opportunity for development i mean heck this thing to me has a better shot than that thing that they kept alive all the way across the north gulf coast until it came across land in texas i don't know it looks pretty healthy to me all right, so last thing I want to touch on here for my friends, and I know we have a lot of viewers in Minnesota and the Dakotas. I used to live in southern Minnesota for several years, love this part of the country. The Dakotas, Minnesota are some of my favorites, North Iowa as well, and that is the area that's under the gun here for a pretty widespread and potentially intense uh, uh, straight-line wind event. Could be some tornadoes embedded, but we do have that wind-driven moderate risk here across the northern tier of the country in parts of western Minnesota, into northern south dakota and then that level three out of five enhanced risk uh, dives deeper into southern minnesota and then we finally lose that severe risk as this likely overnight complex of thunderstorms slides on through i mentioned before derecho potential a derecho much like a tornado is classified after the fact you need to hit a bunch of high-end wind reports that's going to be greater than 70 mile per hour wind reports or 75 mile per hour wind reports um, and then scattered at least 400 miles give or take while doing continuous damage in those continuous severe wind reports which are greater than 58 miles an hour so it's hard to get a derecho classified if it is okay if it's not it doesn't mean that it's any less intense it's just it didn't meet the longevity or the length requirement so you're going to see a lot of stuff on social media that says derecho potential and there certainly is but this is a complex of thunderstorms that could deliver a very high-end wind event across the northern plains and upper midwest if it is or isn't a derecho it's all based on the length and if we get those high-end wind reports so anyway here's the future radar this is going to be on uh, later on tonight, this is 6 o'clock central time, and we start to pop a few supercells out here. So we could get things a little tornadic early on in your evening across the Dakotas. Let me take this out in time because then the real event starts getting going. This is 11 p.m. central time now, so I mean this is late at night. And we have the developing complex of thunderstorms right there. There is we have the moderate risk area. Let's take this further out. And then the complex blows on into Minnesota. If you're not, I have Minnesota dialed up. Um, this is, again, picking up at 11 o'clock central. And look how intense this is coming through. We do have some supercells hanging off the northern end. So we could have some uh, tornadoes as this thing gets going. And we oftentimes see that in these higher end wind events. You get supercellulars kind of merging into a structure uh, that becomes a linear intense damaging wind cluster of thunderstorms look at that i mean i wouldn't be surprised depending upon how this goes if it, the moderate risk and enhanced risk needs to be taken further to the east a little bit this is the high resolution rapid refresh and look at all the purple i mean this is an intense line of thunderstorms this is by the way at two o'clock in the morning central so for my friends in southern Minnesota, I used to live in Rochester, by the way. It's a great part of, of the country, if you've never been. Mayo Clinic is there. Uh, Twin Cities is great. I, I love Minnesota. Um, here is it again, just sliding through. And even now, look at this. This is the first time I've taken it far, further out. It gets what we call that bookend vortice or that little bow echo and the bow echo would be more in northeast iowa the deh that's decora it's a good eagle cam there decora eagles they're famous there um so this little rotating head as we call it, i think my blue out it's right there so i mean these models are crazy these days and they can pick up on these little small scale features but if that is in fact if this comes into fruition at 4 o'clock in the morning central time, 
that's going to do some damage. I mean, that, again, that's one of the telltale things that you would see in, on radar in real time. And I would cut into programming as a professional meteorologist for quote unquote just a severe thunderstorm warning because that would be concerning. That would no doubt be pushing 70, 80 mile per hour wind gusts. Depending upon the environment, it could even be higher. But that is a concerning signature there. And that's kind of the triple point with uh, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Minnesota right there. So you'd be watching that early in the morning. You're getting ready for work. There could be a nasty line of thunderstorms sliding through. And I mean, that slight risk area is still there. But I'm wondering if we may see kind of an expansion to the southeast where that enhanced risk gets pulled further to the southeast if these trends continue. Alrighty, guys, I wanted to touch on that as well because uh, I love the upper Midwest and northern plains. The mesoscale severe meteorology is one of my fortes, and I wanted to touch on that as well for that early heads up again. Be careful. Be safe. My message to anybody in the Dakotas and southern Minnesota and Iowa and really central Minnesota through Wisconsin, make sure that you have a way to get your warnings. Download your stations, your favorite TV stations, local news app. Um... And make sure your alerts are on. That's one good way to get those annoying alerts in the middle of the night to maybe scare you and wake you up. But that's the point of those alerts if you can take shelter if necessary. If we do start popping uh, super damaging winds and tornadoes, certainly. And a weather radio. Again, you never know you need it until you do. It is seriously a great tool to have. I know they people say they might be outdated. Post in the comments, by the way, if you're still with me, if you have a weather radio. I would love to know who has a weather radio here because I still think they are super valuable, especially in times where power can go out. As long as they're charged and have batteries, they're going to get that signal from the National Weather Service so you can stay updated. So as I ramble on, I kind of always end my videos now as I ramble on. I know some of you appreciate that. That's my soapbox today. A weather radio is a must-have, especially when you're talking about uh, severe weather potential like this. And then for my friends across the Gulf Coast and the southeast corner of the United States, um, Puerto Rico, whoever get, gets anything from the National Weather Service, weather radios are the way to go when you're dealing with a hurricane. If you lose power and you lose the ability to connect with your local TV station, which, again, local news is the best way to get you through one of those scenarios um, as well, you're going to have that source information from the National Weather Service. Alrighty, guys. I hope you have a great Monday. Hope you have a great afternoon. Hope you had a great weekend. It's been blazing hot in the south and east. See, I'm rambling on. Have a great afternoon. Be safe. Stay cool. We'll catch you soon.